This show is brought to you by listeners and viewers like you. EvanX.com Tesla Accessories, our Tesla Owners Online.com community, and our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Tesla Owners Online. Welcome, guys. Uh, 2021 is upon us. We thought we'd throw 2020 into the dumpster, but uh, it appears that things are not quite over quite yet. <laughs> And uh, anyways, it's the first uh, first show of 2021, so I want to say thank you for everybody for uh, for join for joining in. Uh, we got a little bit of Tesla news uh, to cover, but um, and and after we get through that, we have our friend Kyle Connor from Outer Spec Motoring who's joined us because they just set a new uh, a new record, and we'll hear all about that. So before we uh, get into things, I also want to say a great big thank you to our sponsors uh, who have uh, kept us going through all these uh, all those times. And uh, a little bit of a, an announcement for anybody who's interested who might have a business on the forum. We have a couple of sponsorship slots open for 2021. And once those are filled, well, they're, they're gone. So if you're interested, uh, reach out to me on the forum or on Twitter or whatever, and we can work something out. So having said that, uh, one other little bit of information, too, that I want to put out. Uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend, uh, the forum will be down for a short amount of time because I'm going to be doing a core update to the software that runs it, bring you guys some new features, which I think you're going to really like. So anyways, I'll put out an announcement on Twitter so everybody's aware of that and stuff. So anyways, yeah, that'll happen not this weekend, but the following weekend, if all things go well. I've been doing some testing. Things are looking really good. But uh, anyways, I'll put out a tweet so everybody knows, and I'll also put an announcement on the forum. Okay, so having said that, uh, Tesla's stock price has been on a tear again. Today it closed at $816.14. Wow. <laughs> no um, kidding. Yeah, S&P 500's done well for them. I guess uh, tech stocks are on the rise again. Uh, it's been crazy. And even aftermarket trading is still up. It's up to 832 831 <laughs> It's It's still flying. It's crazy. There's no end in sight for that stock. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Well, you know, there's always a ceiling for everything. But again, we said that before the stock split, and here we are again. Right. Um, I think pre-split, these numbers are well in excess of $4,000 a share. So yeah. it's just nuts. Anyways, for those of you and some of us that are still invested in Tesla, yay us. So anyways, having said that, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, so the first bit of news I want to get in on here, and I got to get my topics all sorted out here. Uh, Tesla just updated their supercharging map for the 2021 season, and oh my gosh, have you guys seen this map? Here, I'm going to bring it up here so it's that you guys epic. are watching. I couldn't believe it. I mean, these these pins are just it's just crazy. I'm um, just kind of zooming around. You guys can't see it here, but those of you watching on YouTube here, I'm just kind of scrolling around. You guys can see tons and tons and tons of new. Uh, gray pins all over the map. I'm looking at uh, on uh, I'm looking at Western Canada here just for fun, going right up to Prince George in British Columbia, all the way across the highway through Edmonton, filling in all those gaps through Saskatoon, mid Alberta, yeah, and yeah. Uh, filling out Quebec right out to Gaspé, some more yeah. on the East Coast right up into um, in Bedeck in Cape Breton. You, you can do the whole tour of Gaspé now. Yeah, all the way it's around. awesome. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, Newfoundland not getting much love. <laughs> No, I know. When we posted that, the guys in Newfoundland were like, you want all our nickel, man, but you're yeah. not giving us any superchargers. It's um, like, just looking at Mexico, quite a number. Shooting. Nothing on the Baja Peninsula, but uh, quite a bit getting down into Me New Mexico, into the Yucatan. Unfortunately, uh, nothing in uh, Central America, which is kind of retirement city where I want to look at. So I don't know how the heck I'm going to get down there. But hey, if the guys a long way up can do it, maybe I can too. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Let me just quickly zoom out and see what they're showing here in Europe and the rest of the world too, because Europe gets a lot to love too. Oh, tons of pins in uh, the UK. Let's see here. Ireland's got four new pins. Sadly, not enough, I don't think, for a lot of people that want to be there. Let's see here. Germany. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Now, keep in mind, some of these pins, of course, have been pre-existing. Some of them have been shuffled around. Uh, matter of fact, where I live, there was supposed to be a uh, supercharger put in, and it's not on the map anymore. Uh, Supercharger.info still has it. So I don't know. Those guys are a little slow to update their map. But anyways, uh, thoughts on this? I mean, it's it's been crazy. Um, let's see here. What's what's uh, what's Florida looking at for you guys down there? I, I, of course, the, the very first thing I did was explore all of the uh, the Laurentian area where I've you know, tr traditionally been driving in rallies in the last 30 years. And it now makes it really feasible to drive a Tesla in any of our regional events. Yeah, we've got chargers like 
well into the Laurentians now in, in all of the key areas. Le Chute, uh, Saint Sauveur uh, wouldn't mean much to my American friends there, but these are key towns in the hill areas where we have these fantastic roads that are basically wide open in the winter and you can run fantastic road events there. Just looking in so Kyle's I, neck of the woods here in Colorado, yeah. and it looks like I'm seeing about eight or nine pins. Every state that I looked at I had them. I mean, my next my next thing was I, I of course, immediately plotted the route from, from Montreal to Florida to see what <laughs> the next bomb down there is going to look like. And the 81 picked up a lot of them. It was nice to see. Mountain Village, uh, Colorado, just outside of Telluride. And uh, yeah. target opening in 2022. So that's really not until next year. Alamosa, 2022 again. So it looks like not all of them for 2021, but it's nice to see some expansion happening. Yeah, it's it's good to know because I think it serves two purposes having these pins this early. Number one, it at least it lets people know that there are other major roadways that perhaps we're lacking supercharging that are beneficial for certain people. I mean, if I'm cross country, um, you know, from Florida going to say California, there's a couple of different routes I could take. I can stay very very south on I-5, or I can go a little bit north and take I-10, and and keep going that way. So there are, you know, having more superchargers on various uh, different outlets is beneficial because then you can plan your course effectively. Um, I also think that, you know, the majority of existing superchargers, like here in Florida, there's not really many routes I would currently take, even if I was going to west coast of Florida or up through central Florida or even up through the east coast all the way up to, say, Titusville, um, where I would I still wouldn't use the existing network I've already had. So even if they added, say, two superchargers along the I-95 corridor from, say, my residence here in Palm Beach up to, say, St. Augustine, at least there are two others. If I wanted to skip one or if it's closer to a and b or something like that, then you can plan it. But uh, I think for most people, most people, I think, especially here in the U.S., there wouldn't be a significant number of changes to your routes. But over time, it allowed you to take new routes they probably didn't take before. Now, on the map, they also show uh, service as well. Although the service ones just show up as red pins, I'm not seeing anything uh, in terms of gray. I just got notice that there's going to be another service center in my neck of the woods um, covering up the northern Ontario area. Well, when I say northern Ontario, I'm talking about barrier cottage country. Lots of people like to go up that way, so that's good to see. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't show up on the map as, a, as an upcoming one. Uh, let me see here. Destination charging. Yeah, still lots of pins there. I, I, you know, it's good. The growth is 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 crazy. I mean, we've also got noticed that uh, looks like Tesla is in the negotiation stages of opening up another, well, some kind of facility out in the Seattle area as well. So they're certainly growing. By the way, I love how this turned into like supercharger ASMR, where all we're doing is just listing different cities and provinces. That's all we're, <laughs> that's all we're doing. We've got a new one in Barrie. We've got one near New. Hang on, hang on, let me. <laughs> oh, God. There we go. <laughs> no, no, we should just have the sound of plugging into the charge port in and out. No, you just you just need <laughs> the sound of just the sound of when it first starts that whirring. Just... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, and the click of the relays. Right. We can somebody somebody, somebody right, right now was listening to this podcast in their car or in bed or somewhere, and they're like. Keep it up, guys. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody open a start start a YouTube channel there and do the whole ASMR thing. All right. So, anyways, good news on the supercharger front. Um, we're going to be talking about chargers a little bit later in the segment here with Kyle. But, anyways, let's get on here with some more Tesla news, courtesy of our friends at Tesmanian. Uh, Tesla has signed a new deal with Panasonic. Now, for those of you who are not aware, Tesla has a long-standing relationship with Panasonic, who have been uh, making their cells for them, not only at Gigafactory, but also in Japan. Anyway, so battery supplies from Japan, they've signed an agreement that uh, is effective October 1st, 2020, until March 31st of 2022. A little shorter segment than they've done in the past. Uh, no word yet on what they're going to be doing. Um, there was a rumor floating around that it looks like they may start production of 4680 cells uh, in advance of Tesla ramping up theirs, which is good news because um, Tesla may or may not, and I think they're sandbagging in some ways, may or may not be ready uh, for full-blown production on uh, 4680 cells, at least not for the Cybertruck. They could probably do a little bit of that for the upcoming Plaid update. We'll talk about that here in a second uh, for the Model S. But anyways, it's good news on that front. So uh, that relationship is continuing with Tesla, and that's uh, it's always good to see. You know, you know, it's not the only relationship that Tesla has. They also have some with LG Chem and a little bit of Panasonic SDI as well. But Panasonic, or 
Samsung SDI. Sorry, <laughs> I got to correct myself. Um, so anyways, it's good news on that front. Um, again, you have to remember, uh, Tesla is not against buying sales from other manufacturers if it suits them. They have deals in China with, you know, a couple of other companies. Cattle is one of them as well. Um, it's not just about Tesla making their own sales all the time, although that's going to change in the future because, you know, Tesla likes to be a master of their own domain, so to speak. So it's good news on that front. Speaking of which, uh, again, another article from our friends at uh, Tesmanian. Have you guys seen the Model Y demand in China? It is off the charts. Um, January 1st, Tesla posted the official pricing of the Model Y in China. And man, oh man, did they ever get a mad rush of people trying to get in. The official price, um, and unfortunately I don't have it here in front of me um, prior to the change, but on January 1st, the uh, long range, uh, two variants of the Model Y are being offered right now for the long range uh, version is 51000 uh, 890 US dollars converted from one. And uh, the performance one's coming at 56,482, uh, which are really, really good numbers. And of course, that contributed, of course, with pent up demand for that was my wife <laughs> coughing in the background. <laughs> um, with unprecedented demand, I think the reports are coming in, I think over 10 hours that they had over 100,000 sales of the Model Y in China alone. Um, my understanding is that they also have a little bit of relaxed laws as far as license plates are concerned in China, especially with EVs, because they have a typically, um, like if you want to buy a gas car and you live in these large cities, they have these uh, uh, lotteries, right, uh, to get license plates, and they have to bid on them. And anyways, the prices get out of control because so it's very limited. But China uh, is pushing very hard to get into um, sustainable transport and, and electric cars. So they've removed all those tariffs and all that stuff for electric cars, which of course is just causing explosions as far as demand is concerned in China for electric cars. And of course, Tesla's leading the way. So anyways, no surprise there. Um, maybe probably contributed to the rise in Tesla stock price over the last six or seven days, which has just been astronomical. So really good news on that front. Um, let's take a couple of moments here and just talk about this uh, reported Plaid Model S. Unfortunately, I don't have the information, but our friend at, at the Kilowatts had spotted what looked like a... Actually, I do have pictures. <laughs> Let me just see if I can throw it up on the screen here real quick for you guys here. Uh, 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 uh. For those of you who are watching, there you go. Back end of the blue Model S with manufacturer plates. Uh, he caught them driving around the Palo Alto area, which is where Tesla has their headquarters. And he definitely noticed that it had a different rear diffuser. Um, he, th there was a lot of conjecture as to whether the car had a different wider stance. It, that was one of the things he caught in his video. He said that it definitely looked wider. Uh, I'm looking at it and I would say, yeah. Um, the Model S Plaid that they've been testing at the Nürburgring track um, last year certainly sported wider fender flares to accommodate for the wider tires. And it looks like, I mean, we always said that Tesla would do proper stampings, of course, when the time got. So it looks like they're actually doing it at this point. Um, so anyways, it looks like, a, uh, you know, a combination of the factory shutdown, because listen, Tesla's numbers are off the charts as far as deliveries, of course, because they delivered over 500,000 cars, or just shy of 500,000 cars um, for 2020, and they produced over 500,000 cars. And demand for S and X are, are actually up from the other quarters. So you don't shut down a, pa a factory plant or a production line for S and X because demand is low. Doesn't make any sense, right? And we know that's, I think in a lot of ways, Tesla's actually sandbagging as far as when the Plaid Model S, because they said that it was supposed to come out at the end of this year, 2021. I think they're probably ready, maybe a combination of the pilot plant in Fremont making 4680 cells, and this deal, of course, with Panasonic, if Panasonic can ramp up, maybe they're ready to start delivering at least Plaid Model S is a little ahead of schedule. What are your guys' thoughts? So I was in California exactly, uh, I was going to say a year ago, but almost January 15th, 2020. And I was at the Tesla factory charging up at the supercharger. I never shared this picture around because I didn't think anyone would care. <laughs> but now here we go. I saw a Model S getting rolled onto the back of a truck with homogenous taillights. Oh, so, that, there you go. You confirmed no it. Way. There you go. Okay. So, so a little birdie thing. had told me well over a year ago that the Model S was going to get an alteration on the headlights. And that makes total sense because, of course, with the Model, Model 3s and Ys going to Europe, they had the CCS plug on it. So when that when someone told me that they're going to get an updated taillight, of course Model Three was already out. I'm like, okay, this is it. 
they're gonna they're gonna start doing that. So that makes total sense, Kyle. So nice. yeah, some Ooh. changes. How much? I mean, in the exterior. Listen, I'm of the opinion I would love to see a completely redesigned Model S. It's nine years old. But at the same account, you look at the car; it's still beautiful. Um, you know, it's it's not Porsche Taycan in terms of certain, you know a little more radical looks, a little newer type of thing. But the car is aged exceptionally well on the outside. Okay, yeah, they can do some nips and tucks a little bit here and there. But of course, the big one that everybody wants is is a new interior on the car. And uh, listen, I've I've said it many times before: the car definitely needs an upgrade on the interior, not only materials, but the look and feel. And you don't have to go very far. You look at the Y, you look at the Cybertruck, you look at the Roadster, you look at the three, uh, the horizontal screen. Well, the Roadster maybe because it's a little different. But anyways, the future is definitely a horizontal screen. So yeah, uh, I'm going to put some money on the table here. Five bucks. <laughs> uh, when the S comes out, it's definitely going to get an interior refresh for sure. I mean, it just makes total sense. I mean, you know, and, and I think too that if it, it certainly could be a more luxurious interior, more so than well, what that's we're what seeing I now, about materials too, yeah, right. And, and I think, and I think it's you know, if the body style doesn't change all that much, it's not that big a deal. I don't think someone looks at an S and goes, you know, that body really needs something. Otherwise, you know, the interior is perfect. Like most people would, it's more of because of when you're seated inside. I, I mean, I speak to customers all the time, and I tell them when you're inside your car, you don't see the outside. That's true. So ideally, it's the people who are outside of it wishing they could be inside of your car, not someone on the inside wishing they were on the out. So, um, you know, and, and the good thing is there's a lot of aftermarket modifications that people can make to their cars. We know there's tons of companies, uh, sponsors of the show, you know, companies that advertise all over the Internet that do have third party parts for spoilers and drops and all kinds of stuff to modify the S. So, I mean, when you consider what the aerodynamic if it coefficient drag was of that vehicle when it first came out, I mean, it's been now, it'll be nine years this year. Uh, the numbers were just jaw dropping, right? And then and they haven't really changed it much since then other than the major refresh of the fascia after X came out in 2016. So, you know, they, they know it works. They know why they can get these numbers out of the plaid vehicle because Ideally, you're using the same body design, just making a few tweaks here and there to make it more of a sportier design. Um, but I believe it's the interior of all things that needs the greatest attention. And and yes, we're we're seeing that new Tesla footprint uh, in Y and the semi and everything else. Excuse me, uh, we're seeing that for sure. But I I, I still think it's going to be that plus plus like there's gonna be there's gonna be something that differentiates the three from the s as far as the interior is concerned to really remind people no you're in for sure a high-end luxury vehicle the other thing too that uh, came out is our friend green the only on twitter um who does a lot of digging in tesla firmware when it comes out he's discovered that the the s has reference to an internal facing camera much like the three and the y does so at the very least we might see mm -hmm. that, but it makes total sense to do the whole thing. I mean, you know, Tesla really wants to do the, the FSD and the robo taxi, and you know, they were forward thinking of putting the camera in there. Uh, we're still waiting for the fabled version 11, which is still escapes us at this point. Yeah, we did have the holiday update that had some fun stuff, but the uh, the big update that everybody was waiting for, of course, and everybody's been disappointed, of course, because we didn't get this and this and this and this. Um, I mean. Version 11, yeah, maybe it's a little behind. Uh, traditionally, we've always had uh, a release, you know, anywhere from August to December pre uh, previously. We didn't get one this year. We got a holiday update. Um, but we still haven't seen version 11. There's a good chance they may wait for version 11 a little bit later or perhaps as soon as uh, first quarter or uh, beginning of second quarter, I should say. Uh, the other thing, too, I should mention, and I'm sorry for jumping around here, that Tesla tends to int introduce the big updates to these cars at the beginning of a quarter. Because that's, you know, when they have to produce the cars and they have to ship them overseas, that's the longest time frame they have to do. So they have to do it at the start of a quarter. So my suspicion here is that uh, we're still in January. So once the factory reopen, the production lines for SNX reopen on the 11th, uh, we could see an update on the website as soon as probably about mid-month uh, for people to start placing orders. for, Or they will reveal it at that point and then delivery should happen towards the end of the month, at least for North America. So anyways, we'll keep an eye on this, uh, but I have a pretty... 
I don't know. All you know, shake your magic eight ball. All point signs, all, all signs point to possibly yes at this point. So it's looking promising on, on this point. I mean, it's high time. Uh, like I said, I don't really have a problem with the exterior of the car, but I think if you sit anybody who's been in a, in a three or a Y or whatever, and you sit them in the Model S and they go, yeah, okay. I mean, if you sat in a Porsche Taycan, for example, it's like, okay, the Model S for this kind of price? Yeah, it definitely needs a, a major upgrade. So speaking of which, that's pretty, I mean, there's other Tesla news, but this is kind of the important stuff we wanted to get off our chest and stuff because it's still early in the year. But we brought our friend Kyle on because Kyle and his friends just set another EV cross-country cannonball record. So we thought we'd bring Kyle on, and they just announced it this morning. So uh, here's your chance, Kyle. Tell us all about it. What happened? How did it come about? What car did you use? What charging uh, system did you use? Yeah, well, so we had the record. My friend Matthew Davis and I set the record last year, a year and a half ago now, in a Tesla Model 3 long-range rear-wheel drive, the best road trip configuration of a Model 3. And uh, we had that car on aero wheels. We should have had it on fast EVO1s, but I think that's before <laughs> I knew yes. about EVO1s. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, we Martian had that wheels car too, on, right? Right. Yeah, well, yeah. So we had that car on arrows and then lowered it to the ground as low as we could possibly get it. Uh, and that was really the only modification we made. We ran the traditional cannonball route, which was uh, New York City Red Ball Garage to Portofino Hotel Marina. Uh, in Redondo Beach, California, basically southwest LA. And I think I came on the show and we talked about that uh, a year and a half ago. We did. And that was pretty cool. Um, but it wasn't anything that revolutionary. All that we had done better was optimize our charging and driving style better than other people in basically the same car. Uh, because it's just another Tesla run that was a little bit quicker and like, okay, it was kind of cool. As far as I'm aware, there have been, I think, 12, but let's just say more than 10 attempts uh, to break that record in Teslas. Long range plus Model S's, uh, Model 3 dual motors, performances, all kinds of modifications, and no one's been able to get there. And that's partially, one, because I think we did a really good job optimizing, but two, I think Tesla really backed off their aggressive charging curves from the time when we did our run. You know, our car would do 150 kilowatt pretty deep into the mid 40% range, maybe almost 50. Now you're lucky if you're getting that above 35. Yeah. So um, we thought, okay, well, we, there's no reason to do another Tesla run. We know they're quick across the country at this point. Like all we'd be doing is uh, maybe taking a Model S long range plus and beating our long range record. But that, it, like, who cares if it was 10 minutes faster? Like it makes no difference. We're like, you know what? Everyone thinks you cannot get around on the public networks, the CCS networks. They're like, uh, you know, you know how you know you, you see an e-tron, someone buys it. They're like, cool. How can you drive outside of your driveway? Like, <laughs> how do you get around? Yeah. And I'm like, I, I'm not really a like, I, I'm brand agnostic, so I don't really care. But I will say, like, we have four times as many CCS chargers in the Denver Denver area, maybe five times as many than we do superchargers. I'm like. Wait, it's the other way around. If you have a Tesla, how are you going to get around? I can get around everywhere on CCS. Uh, so it's like, uh, let's go see if this theory is possible. So we mapped out a route with uh, chargers across the country. We said, look, we'll open it up to any charging provider as long as we can get the fastest power uh, you know, available at any given point. And it just turned out Electrify America had 350 kilowatt chargers across the entire thing. There was only one point where EA did not have any chargers, nor did anyone, on the southern route, I-40, the traditional route, which was like Arizona, so like basically Flagstaff to Barstow, and it's like 300-something miles, and it's just not possible to do it in an EV, which is crazy, because it's like, you're going to drive across I-40, what's going on here? So apparently EA has CCS chargers, three of them installed, construction site completed, but power companies have not turned them on. Mm. So I, that's very frustrating. So we're like, okay, we got to take the Northern route. And then we're like, okay, it's the end of December and we got to go through the Rockies and the whole Northern U S and we're like, this is not good because it's cold. We're going to have tons of headwinds. We're going to have, you know, potentially closed roads due to snow. And we're like, everything's looking bad, but let's get the car. And we had been working to get this Taycan 4S with the specification we wanted uh, from Porsche for a while, just for my own testing. Uh, you know, I do EV range tests and charging curve tests on every electric car, and I like to have the most efficient aero wheels for these tests. So Porsche uh, 
uh, got us a, a Tycon 4S, which is the most efficient configuration. Uh, there's two trims above the 4S, the Turbo and the Turbo S. None of them have turbos. Uh, and then uh, basically the 4S is small motors all around, but still two speed on the rear. So we're like 4S, massaging seats, thermal double plated glass, and aero wheels. This is the car. We got to do it. We got to at least try. So I pick up the car in Florida. We had it shipped to Miami. So I was like, hot weather, range test first with a fresh battery, right? See if we can get as many miles out of it in my loop style test. So did some stuff in Florida with it for like four or five days, hopped in, drove it straight up to New York, and instantly everything went wrong. Mm. And we're like, oh, gosh, this sucks. And what happened was uh, I get to my first charging point. Uh, on this trip and it's an electrify america station 150 kilowatt and the car says hi i'm a porsche the charger says hi i'm an ea charger the porsche says give me everything you got and the charger says there's 300 kilowatts but it's (laughs) only a 150 yeah and it's like i can't do that and so the charger shut down and this kept happening over and over and so there was a problem in that handshake protocol where the charger and the car introduce each other and so now I'm like, oh, gosh, this is off to a bad start. So anyway, I get charged up. I find one charger that actually just sits at 120 kilowatts. I'm like, whatever, we're just heading up. So let's go. Uh, the one thought I had in the back of my head was we had told EA we were doing this trip. And um, for better or for worse, they take our trips pretty seriously now after we had some issues. So they went through every single station that we would be hitting on this drive. They had engineers sent out to them. They had make sure, making sure the software was up to date and that the chargers were good. And if they weren't, they were fixing them. So we knew they had gone through our our full route. So after my first charge in Florida, which was a disaster, I start heading to the next charger up the highway. Uh, And on that drive, I can't remember if it was this leg or another, but the Taycan just gets lost. The car on the GPS starts (laughs) driving a completely different way from where I'm going. And I'm like, uh, car reset, please. Sorry to interrupt there, uh, Kyle, but uh, I'm going to put a link in the uh, video in the podcast description for those who want to uh, hear the whole story from a great article on the drive. Uh, You guys gave him a good article on that. Uh, Wonderful read. Uh, So make sure you read it so you understand a little bit more what Kyle's talking about. But uh, anyways, keep going, Kyle. Sure. I'll make it pretty quick, too. Anyway, car gets lost. We're on our way to the next charger. And I'm like, great, we have some 350 kilowatt chargers at this one. It's an off-highway, non-metro charger. Let's do it. So the Tycon says, hi, I'm a Porsche. Charger says, hi, I'm a charger. Porsche says, give me everything you got. The charger said, great, here's 300 kilowatts. And the Porsche says, now it's this time the charger can deliver the power. And the Porsche is saying, hey, I can't take that much. So now I'm like, oh, I got to use the 150s. So I go to the 150s and those work fine. I'm like, ah, so are we going to be limited to 150 kilowatt charging maybe on this trip? Anyway, I make my way up to New York over a couple of days. I get a flat tire on the way up there, have to take a pit stop in South Carolina. And, uh, saw that. <laughs> you know, it's just all bad. So we get to get to New Jersey. Our co-driver Drew flies in and um, we're like, OK, we got to get the car fixed. We need navigation because it does on route battery preconditioning, just like the Tesla. Yeah. Uh, and it's going to be cold. It's going to be, you know, we're predicting, you know, 10 degrees Fahrenheit across the trip. We mm. actually saw as low as five degrees Fahrenheit on the trip. And we were like, we need this battery toasty. Uh, bring it to Paul Miller Porsche. They literally stopped the entire service operations. They're pulling Tycons off the lot, ripping GPS antennas off of them, like tearing up like four cars right now we have in pieces to try to get our little, you know, 4S fixed. And, and, the, and, reason, like, and the reason for this, Kyle, ahead. was was if I remember correctly, according to the article, it thought you were in Ohio and it didn't want to budge. Right. It, it Basically, it, it originally went Arizona, then it went uh, West Virginia. And then during the trip, it thought it was in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so confused, but also we didn't have cell connectivity to the car. Oh. So our, our plan was because the, the SIM card also crapped out. So <laughs> our plan was to navigate to chargers near where the car thought it was. It thought it was in Columbus and we're like plenty of DC chargers. We'll just tell it we're go- We're going to one of those. The problem is when the Tycon loses cell connectivity, it only, you know, all of the chargers that are stored, it limits them to 100 kilowatts. If they're a 50 or a 350 kilowatt charger, it just says 100 kilowatt. And it will only precondition if it's more than 145 oh. kilowatts. And so, like, we got hit on two ends here. <laughs> anyway, we go to the dealer. They're like, sorry, we can't fix anything. And it needs a whole new control module that needs to be shipped from Germany. And we're like, oh, well, okay. But they did wash the car really nicely. They got all the fingerprints <laughs> out. Well, so, you know, we, we asked. 
asked for the extra wax for extra slipperiness. Uh, so <laughs> Ceramic coat. They, yeah. So they did a great wash on the car, but you know, that was a 12 hour operation. Uh, so we leave, actually we go to Tom Malagny's business, charge up the car on his CCS charger uh, in Jersey, run into New York City and we're heading out on the red ball myself. Uh, heading out on the cannonball myself, Timon Schroer, and Drew Peterson. Drew owns Martian Wheels. Timon is our uh, our videographer and photographer for Out of Spec, and uh, uh, you know I'm me. So we basically had 27, 28 stops planned and start shredding it. We had spotters out of New York City, which was great. So we were able to really get the speeds down originally uh, on that first couple legs. Ran into a little bit of rain and snow. But um, that was expected, and then the rest of the trip was just smooth sailing from weather. A little bit of dense traffic, actually. We thought, like, some of these COVID runs, like, no one would be on the road. Well, that was not the case. <laughs> and, um, you know, so we just, uh, I'd say, had normal traffic. And, you know, these charging issues didn't go away. But uh, we, we battled through. We basically moved around a lot. We had to have the battery pack temperature at 85 degrees Fahrenheit for a fast charge because that was just cold enough for the Porsche to send another line of code that says, hey, don't give me everything you got. I'm thermal throttling. So and then after about a minute, it would warm up and it would actually do the 260 kilowatt charging rate. Um, and so we learned this like four or five charging sessions in. And by the time we got to Denver, uh, we were like three hours behind because we had so many charging issues. Uh, and then it was just 270 kilowatts or 260 kilowatt charging at that point. We're like, great, the faster we can charge, the faster we can drive. We put the pedal through the metal through the Rockies, which was awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, cold temps, but but Drew lived in Vail for like seven years. He knew every corner and we were put down. <laughs> and uh, then we get another 260 kilowatt charger. Now we're making up time. And uh, anyway, ended up coming into uh, the Portofino about 50 minutes um, faster than um, our previous Tesla Model 3 record. So the photograph that I have up here shows 44 hours, 25 minutes, 59 seconds. Is that uh, yep. about right? That is exactly right. Uh, excellent. Um, one other thing I think that was mentioned in the article, of course, is this battery preconditioning. Uh, apparently with the Taycan, you can actually force it manually. Is that right? So the only way you can force it manually is by driving the nuts off of it. <laughs> <laughs> well we won't uh <clears throat> yeah oh, okay <laughs> that's the only manual control we had over battery pack temperature was how much throttle but that's another challenge right because then you need enough buffer of energy to drive it hard and then also mm -hmm. if you drive it hard at low state of charge we didn't want to run into the same issue you guys had on your cross canadian run where like the car freaked out with eight percent remaining right oh, so it yeah. gets confused yeah, don't remind me so well we had all of these constant calculations and decisions we were making in real time and uh you know it, it wasn't easy but we did get across the country faster in worse conditions uh, using Electrify America than the Tesla Supercharger Network. And that's mainly because of 350 kilowatt chargers across the country where Tesla only has, I think, two version threes on the route. And oh, wow. one of them you kind of have to divert for. Mm. Well, it's actually nice that you did this because in, in a lot of ways you're kind of doing the same thing that Ian and I were trying to prove in the sense that, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, you can't go very far in an electric car and it takes charging too long and it's too cold and you can't do anything. And, and that was the point we did in the winter. And in your case, you're doing it with, well, obviously with a non-Tesla at this point on a different type of charging network and you still came out great. So, I mean, obviously in, in ideal conditions, would you would have beat that number for sure. And it would be a lot easier, of course, and less stress on you. Sure. That's cool. Yeah. We were, I, we were predicting a low 40 hour. Sorry, go ahead. No, so I also, I, in the article you said 42, I, I think, was what you're calculating. You think you can get it less, less than 42? Uh, no, 42 was, was sort of our winter ideal okay. if we had 270 kilowatt chargers following the charging curve. Uh, then that would have been ideal. But uh, unfortunately, that was not the case. How long is that, that trip, Kyle, in terms of miles? What is that? Uh, just about 28.50. Okay, that's what there. I thought because yeah, that sounds about right because the Canadian one's a thousand more, right, Ian? Uh, yeah, well, a little over thirty-eight hundred. Thirty-eight yeah. hundred miles. Yeah. Eric, still, I cut you off still, yeah, you guys had a much yeah, longer. I, yeah. My my feelings on these endurance tests um, is I, I mean I, I walk away. Uh, actually, I'm sitting here still, but I, I, <laughs> I as I sit here, um, I am impressed by and large because. It is going to, I think we're going to continue over time seeing these numbers 
broken every every so often because uh, vehicles have larger battery packs, uh, find faster charging networks. Uh, a lot of the issues that Kyle experienced on his route uh, with the vehicle basically going schizo, like that's not really going to happen with software fixes and stuff like that. So we know we know that you know these numbers. I mean, look, it's conceivable we could see someone do a run like this in under forty if you take the right route and you have ideal conditions, right? Um, the only thing I, to me, like I look at this, and this is not this is not being judgmental. So forgive me if this sounds like this, and I'm really speaking to our audience, our YouTube commenters, and nobody else. Um, <laughs> but I, I always feel like these are like the zero to sixty tests. Like the average person's not doing this kind of route. Like it's yes, like it shows people. Yeah, you could go across the country, across Canada. You can go across the United States, and you can make these long distance drives in these electric cars and get you know here's what the time would be. But most people wouldn't drive that long, especially if they're driving by themselves or with family, because you're stopping every so often for food. You're probably staying at hotels. Like you're, you're going to be doing things that on a road trip, a true road trip, uh, you wouldn't do for these tests. The goal for these tests is not just to prove the vehicle's viability, but it's to also prove like we can get there really effing fast. Um, which a true uh, uh, vacationer would not do, because if you wanted to go there really effing fast, you would just fly somewhere and not drive across the country in three days. Um, and this is speaking for someone who drove from California to Florida in just over three days. So um, so I will say that the numbers are very impressive. Um, but I, I guess the question I have for Kyle is this. Now, are we at the question phase now of our conversation? I just want to be sure. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> If you, if there was only two of you, would it have been more difficult? I know that Ian and Trevor were the only two guys in the Model 3 when they did the Trans-Canada trip. I would imagine having three passengers is easier because you can get more breaks, more rest amongst the three of you. Would it? Would you feel like you could do the same endurance test with just two and be as fast? Yeah, well, my first uh, record, which was the Model 3, uh, that, that was just two people. I right. think three people was nice. I had two of my best friends with me, right? That's right. great. So we just had a blast, you know, basically car spotting. The, so here's the thing. I agree with you. This is not fun. Uh, there is nothing enjoyable about cannonballing. It, it, the way I relate mm -hmm. to it is imagine driving like you're late for work for 44 hours. <laughs> you're stressed and you're yeah. like, I got to get this. Right? So <laughs> it's not fun. And it, you know what? There is. Yeah. Basically, like coming into L.A., we were just like everyone out of the way we found we basically we, i always play this game in the los angeles you piss someone off on purpose so they rip and they push all the traffic out of the way for you so we'd find people in the tycon i'd floor it next to them and then they'd want to go so then they'd get everyone out of the way you're so just this an is ambulance all, you know, chaser that's all you are <laughs> right well well no it, it's it's traffic psychology you have to play other drivers but you also need to go quick enough to where you don't piss people off like there's a difference between someone saying that guy's an idiot and then calling the cops on that guy because yeah. he's an idiot. So we are very respectful in our driving. We never pass trucks at high speed. This is not about speed. This is about charging networks. Um, and that's the thing. Uh, we could have gone and said, we printed out a sheet of paper that said the Tycon's faster than a Model 3 on the Cannonball. Cool. Says it right here. We don't need to go anywhere. The, it's right here. It's on paper. However, uh, people will only relate to our stories if we do them in, in person. And uh, this is not a look at how much quicker we beat our previous record. The time doesn't matter to me. It's the fact that for the first time, there's true long distance road trip competition to Tesla. Uh, mm -hmm. And now it starts the wars. And this is I'm really excited about because now it's Model S Plaid Lucid Air. And actually on paper, the Lucid Air would win because there's more high power chargers across the country. Um, I would love to run both at the same time. Am I going to do another cannonball though? Poof, I really don't want to. Fine Lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. Uh, I mean, you're looking terrible. We need a break. Kyle, we'll do it in the yeah. Roadster. <laughs> well, that's, that's going to be interesting, right? The Roadster yeah. is all about the charging curve for how long. And I imagine for a while, 
even if they're a 150 kilowatt chargers, we'd be able to sustain that charging power Much for deeper. so long. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that I get you. But if you're in a chance to do a semi across the country cannonball run, you'd be signing up for that. Let's go. <laughs> oh, a semi, absolutely. And we're gonna build yeah. like this egg shell around the back. Uh, but, yeah. but I think we have to classify it as an RV, so we don't need a CDL <laughs> to drive it, so yeah. we don't have to do electronic logbooks. <laughs> Nah. I've thought yeah. about this. Super <laughs> important. Look at this guy. He's already got a game. Yeah, so, oh, he's got it figured out. Right. Uh, yeah, my so, question. And you know what? And we, and we we've waxed poetic on the show before about the need for versatile charging networks. I mean, what Tesla done? What Tesla did set the footprint um, for how this actually goes. Uh, and I say footprint, not blueprint, on purpose because ideally it is the trail you leave behind that others can then follow. So ideally, it is now the point where all these companies. Um, whether it's um, uh, Clipper or whether it's, uh, you know, all these other uh, companies that are now coming forward with all their various charging solutions, especially if they're intracity or if they're, especially if they're uh, across the networks, it's imperative because you need as t- basically if these companies come forward and say, look at the infrastructure we've now built out for you, GM, Toyota, et cetera. That only would then encourage them to go, well, if we do build an electric car, we now have a network that the public can use so we can sell in these different markets. And therefore, that hopefully increases the volume. So it, it is there is this tangible relationship that we need between these two different entities. That's vital because uh, not every company is going to do what Tesla did, which, again, I keep hammering this home. Tesla is an energy company. So, yes, they're going to have an energy charging infrastructure to power the very vehicles that they're producing. But not every cons- uh, company can do that. They build cars. You're absolutely right. And this this chicken before the egg scenario is we'll make electric cars when people can get around. And then the other side of it, we'll put chargers in when they're electric cars to yeah. use them. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Trev and I have been going back and forth on this for a while on multiple different platforms now and different shows. Uh, automakers did not realize that they had to be so involved with charging, right? Mercedes has never like put in a fuel station uh, situation, right? Daimler's never invested in, in, in gas station rollout. Like, why would they have to do this? They build cars. Someone else can figure out how to fuel them. Uh, well, but it's with the wrong mentality. Vehicles, it's much more important. Yeah, well, it's the wrong mentality. I mean, that's something that Tesla understood right from the beginning. In order to survive and make the cars viable, they had to do a charging network. I mean, otherwise, it would have never happened, right? But I think what you're saying as well is because the CCS network is so big now because of Electrify America, you got the, the traditional manufacturers is like, well, it's too late for us now. We don't really need to do it anymore because you know the infrastructure is in place, and and that's great. Um, but I, I, you know, I think there's a large par- portion of the public that still assumes that the GMs and the Fords and everybody else also needs to build their own network where I, I don't think they really need to anymore. Yeah. Whether EA is the answer or not, I, again, I don't have it. I will say they're the big dogs right now. Any automaker that's coming in, it's cheaper them for write a check for X number of millions of dollars to EA mm-hmm. and say, build out your network a little bit more. So we have more capacity and certify our cars to work with them than it is to build out a hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts to build out their own network that's going to be worse so uh, yeah. so yeah. so i have two questions for you kyle um one of them is, is uh, the car related and the other one really has to do with the network itself now considering that you had mm, some challenges with the ea network especially with this particular tycon uh, what 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 has been your experience with other cars using the ea network because you've tested a lot of other cars and stuff in, in, in terms of I mean, we all know the supercharger network is very frictionless. You plug it in, it's done. You don't have to worry about it. Communication works and stuff. Um, what's been your experience using? Well, let's let's just take EA as an example. How? Yeah. How... Well, it's I, I've been using EA for almost two years now. Uh, I own a CCS vehicle. I'm also lucky enough where I get to test every electric car, so I, yeah. I'm constantly test doing charging tests and stuff. And it's been rocky. And I will say, I give them extreme credit where it's due. Uh, And I also give them huge flack where it's due, right? So I, again, I'm very objective. I don't like or dislike them. It's individual problems that I'll report on about them. So for example, when they first rolled out their stations and everything was going, we're like, holy crap, the build out's insane. And I'm like, to Tesla owners, I'm like, did you see what these guys are doing? They're spending all this money, granted they had to, but they're spending all this money on this amazing uh, 350 kilowatt powered network 
across the country and everyone's like, oh, okay, well, where are you going to charge it? I'm like, wait, no, I just told you they're putting in the chargers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's one side. The second side is, is station reliability, but also the difficulty with this. So uh, I understand the inner workings more than the average person, but not to the technical engineering level. So what happens with EA is they have to go to multiple different providers of their hardware. They have to go to ABB, Signet, FSEC, uh, and BTC Power is the was the original four uh, that they put in. So now you have four companies from four different parts of the planet on very different time zones that need to work with your back-end software. And, oh, by the way, they have to charge every electric vehicle that's coming out. And most every electric vehicle from different automakers aren't always using the correct standards. So their process was let's certify each car in the lab to get them to work with each station variation that we have. And that kind of works, but it's it sucks that it's not necessarily EA's fault that the automakers aren't following the correct standards. They still get blamed for them because their chargers didn't work. And I'm not trying to defend them. This has just been the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in that case, uh, there's like cars like the Volvo XC40 that just will not charge on Signet chargers right now. You just pull up to one, it plugs in, it says, I have no idea who you are. I have no idea who you are both ways. And it says, sorry, nothing I can do. Yeah. So what so, does the consumer feel about that? You know? Well, look, it's not EA's fault. They, they, uh, you know, Volvo should have called EA and said, Hey, I want to bring you two XC forties, whatever variations, please make sure they work on your network. Um, and they just didn't. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. The other thing EA uh, can do, which is not great, is they'll send buggy software out to their chargers. They have payment issues. Uh, their chip readers rarely work. Uh, their tap to pay, I've never gotten to work. Their, um, their swipe to start activation has been flawless this entire trip, which was great. But you still have to go on your phone to activate. And now with VIN, uh, you know, plug-in charge technology, we're starting to get closer to a Tesla-like experience where you can have a Mustang Mach-E, uh, or a 2021 Porsche Taycan, ours was a 2020, and you just plug in, you set up the account once, and it just connects and charges, and it builds your account. That's where we need to get. They're getting there, but it's so difficult when you have such a small team, and they're limited on their capacity of engineering team based off of the restrictions put on them from the U.S. government when they set this whole thing up as a punishment. They had to spend a certain portion of their budget on infrastructure, another portion on uh, staffing, and so the staffing portion is really strapped. My answer is why not just hire someone under Volkswagen and put them in the EA office? I don't know. Speaking of but, which, for those of you who are not aware, the whole EA network was uh, uh, restitution for Dieselgate. This is a Volkswagen initiative. So somewhere around $2 billion they had to, I think it was $2 billion or so, that they had to put into this thing. So when you understand, when, when you hear Kyle saying, you know, this is, you know, payment for this kind of thing, that was because of Dieselgate. All right, so my next question, and I'm, I'm sorry, I know Ian and Eric probably have some others here. Um, I'm frothing, dude. I'm frothing <laughs> okay, 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 hold on. Let, let, me, let me get this one off the back. Uh, um, so three of you in a Taycan, I, I've been in a Taycan, uh, the rear seat is pretty small. <laughs> How did you, I mean, the, the Model 3, I mean, yeah, it's a little more roomy, but, you know, of course your legs are elevated and stuff, so sitting in the back seat's not exactly fun either. Um, how how was that trip <laughs> doing it with three guys in a in a small little back seat? So the other guys hated it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably because they had to sit in the car with me for 44 hours. But also, uh, you know, they were jammed. I jammed in there. I don't know. I fit pretty good in the back because I tend to slouch. So you man spread around the front seat. Your head's pretty far down and back. And then you're just like, I was pretty comfortable in the back seat. You also have like great heated seats and good air conditioner and controls and stuff. <laughs> Massage in the front, yes, absolutely. That came very much helpful on this trip because the Model Three seats are, I still think, are one of the best seats in automotive history. Yeah, I, you can sit in those things. I don't forever know how and feel they've no got it pain. so right on that car right from the beginning is beyond yeah. me because Tesla's oh, gone best. through. I mean, they've gone through five different seat designs on the Model S. I mean, the first Model S seats. Oh my God, they're oh, so, so bad. bad. They're so bad. <laughs> but anyways, they nailed it on the three. Thank you. Yeah, the best Model S seats were the second gen, or I think they were called the next gen were yes. cars built seats mm -hmm. and then they got rid of those for their own they went to futurist or something like that and, yeah, yeah i had the newer ones in my model s and man were they garbage uh but the model three seats amazing the tycon really good seats for like the first five hours and then it starts to get a little firm and they I, do hold you in they're meant for performance i you can have 
four different seating options in Tycon. We had the 14 ways. I bet the 18 ways are more comfortable. I absolutely I positively know. hate driving my wife's Volkswagen Golf. Those seats are just like the Model S seats, the first one. They're so flat. Oh, they're horrible. I hate driving that car. Interesting. Ugh. Yeah, so so actually, I we all spent probably equal time in the back of the Tycon. I was pretty comfortable. I did like a night the full night stretch i kind of slept for three legs back there time and took us through a lot of the long and cold and boring nebraska you know repetitive just charge up enough and cruise just to get through the middle of the country type thing um but yeah it wasn't it wasn't too bad the front seats were pretty comfortable massaging seats were great um yeah it's cool all right ian okay the first thing i need to know <laughs> is what was the lowest soc you guys hit with this car on it? good idea yeah good point I think zero. <laughs> no way. You zeroed it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, like okay. on purpose. So the Tycon, yeah. Tycon's so easy to run out of juice because it has an extremely accurate BMS at the bottom. So we knew exactly what was going on. We also, the Tycon, not that we ever ran into this on the trip, but I've run Tycons over the last year or so out of juice for my range testing many times. Mm -hmm. uh, when it dies, it hits zero, kind of goes dash, dash, and just shuts off. But there's another 500 watt hours in there, maybe six, 700 watt hours when you restart it. So then you could just go and then it's like in turtle mode. Um, but you never, like it gives you a strong warning. Now, is that the right strategy? I don't think so because then you have to spend all the energy to speed back up after a restart. Yeah. I'd rather it just run out when it's dead. Uh, but that's the strategy they took with Etron and Tycon and, uh, it worked. So yeah, very easy to get low state of charge. We, we targeted 3% plug in at each station. Uh, sometimes we'd use a little extra, get down to two or one. Some stations were closer to each other. I think the lowest or the highest we ever plugged in was like 16 or 17%. Okay. Well, it brings my next question is, did you find it easier to predict the consumption in the Taycan versus Model 3? Like which one did you say was more consistent in terms of predicted consumption versus what you actually got? Yeah. Uh, well, I think if we had the navigation system working in the Taycan, it would give us predictive analysis on route given elevation, uh, at, just like the Tesla does when yep. you go to your, your future predictions. We didn't have any of that, but I had created a booklet. I wish I had it around uh, that gave us an elevation profile of each leg oh, because nice. I wasn't uh, just because I, don't, I didn't know the Porsche system as well as the Tesla. I was like, maybe it's wrong. Well, we'll know exactly how much gain and loss and then overall gain and loss we would have. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't bad. Basically, if we had an elevation gain, we'd just charge a little bit more than the guesso meter would say. If we had a loss, we would charge identical to the mileage remaining and then just drive faster. Okay. Um, I think you were using a better route planner as well, were you not? Uh, not during the trip, but the pre-trip planning, okay. timing, uh, ev everything was done with uh, ABRP, which is a fantastic service. That's what we use too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, 100. percent You know, we we compare the two, and uh, it's nice to be able to dial in all of the variables. Like uh, it, it understands elevation, the temperature, the load of the car, all that stuff. No, I loved it for that. Um, where was I going after that? Okay. So typically to get to the next station, I mean, obviously there would be huge variations along the route depending on the distances, but what were you typically having to go up to like 50, 60, 70%? Like what was your normal sort of, you know, uh, cutoff point before you could leave? Well, just like all the previous runs and just like you guys, if we were getting maximum speeds, we would never leave because we'd use that juice at some point. Yeah. So we would never, uh, you know, leave before a taper. But what we would do is we would uh, charge until it tapered down to under 200 kilowatts. At that point, we'd say, can we stretch it to the next charger? This was usually around 45, 50, 55 percent, totally dependent on uh, many factors, way more factors of, uh, of kilowatt rates at the given state of charge than Tesla. It's very complicated with EA throttling sometimes and the Porsche throttling sometimes. Um, but we would basically charge up to 55, 60 percent. Uh, and I think the highest we ever had to charge to was like 76% for a really long stretch. How big is the battery pack on that again? 95 kilowatt hours? Yeah, so it's 93 nominal or okay. gross installed capacity, but it lets you use 87, okay. something like this. Well, that's good. Yeah, so there's a buffer. Uh, yeah. What um, What's fascinating about this, I mean, you know, I, I know the main thing was to prove that you can – do these kind of speeds across the country and something other than Tesla that, you know, the EA network is finally offering an alternative. And I'm with you. I, as much as I adore Tesla, 
I like having competition out there, you know, like I think even the most diehard Apple fans appreciate Android because it keeps Apple honest, right? And I think that's what we all want is we want to see, you know, like someone pushing behind them so that they keep upping their game. I think that's good for the industry at large. So that I'm, I'm very, very happy about. Um, but um, where the hell was I going with this? Um, coming back to the Taycan. Um, I've completely lost my train of thought. I'm sorry about that. Um, so could I ask my question now? Yeah, go, I'm you sure go ahead. While you, I'll, while you I'll, try I'll, to I'll, regain your I'll usefulness. Do a, I'll do a reset. Yeah, go ahead. So I guess the um, what the viewers, and I'm getting uh, a lot of calls and notes now from people watching the show. Um, they want to know how much food did you eat and how much liquid did you drink? Uh, I don't really know. We So before the trip, we're going to have a whole video next week on like, here's how many chargers we stopped at. Here's how much it costs. Because I don't actually know the number. We haven't tallied anything up yet. <laughs> we'll do all that because sometime soon. But um, before the trip, while we were charging it up at Tom's place he owns like this strip mall one of them is like a uh, convenience store we just kept the lights on in that convenience store for the next three months with how much food we bought <laughs> so uh, you know basically we just loaded up the entire driver's side rear seat of snacks and waters and red bulls and beef jerky and you name it we got it uh you know yogurts and you know, charcuterie boards, like we went all out. And we're, <laughs> but, you know, and so the, the rear seat passenger was snack giver outer. I would say we snacked a, a significant portion of the time. Uh, we did uh, have the opportunity to get out and pee at um, uh, charging stops, which is great. Uh, but actually not enough time to run inside the store many of the time. So sorry to all the security cams across the country that may have seen some <laughs> things they don't want to see. But, uh, you know, basically we just, uh, you know, it's, it's a plug in the car, make sure it's charging. That was like the first five minutes because that's not a question with Tesla for the most part. Uh, but with our side, it was like, is it actually charging? We'd have to move it around sometimes to get it to yeah. connect and charge. And then pee, and then the car was done, and then we'd leave. Our charging stops were incredibly short. I, I, I am now imagining you guys, all three of you, in planning this trip, looking at, you know, ABRP and doing all the other stuff, and then you're watching, like, on another computer screen, the video of these two guys in Canada, whether sitting inside a restaurant, sitting down, having a nice hot breakfast, enjoying their coffee, like, cars charging, you're like, these mother efforts get to sit down and have a damn breakfast. What? <laughs> there is nothing that's like funny. doing a long trip like that and finally sitting down and having a nice, like, yeah. meal that's like, okay, we don't have to go anywhere. You can have a enjoy long yourself. Ooh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they have time. I know exactly yeah, we, how you feel. We treated uh, every second of this drive like, uh, again, uh, the way I do cannonballs is I don't, even though we could go slower and make our next run easier if we were to ever do it again. Mm -hmm. But that's not our style. It's optimize every inch, make it yeah. so someone else is going to have a really hard time to beat it. <laughs> and if they do beat it, then they deserve it. Um, yeah. You know, so these are the the way we feel. And um, yeah, because I I've seen a lot. Like I said, ten attempts of people trying to break our previous record years later. And uh, so I know, I know we optimized pretty well. Mm -hmm. Not to say we were the fastest. We left time on the table, lots of time. Uh, but but we definitely optimized. Well, that's and what that, records that's are for. They're meant to be broken, right? I mean, hey. You yep. lighten the load with one less passenger and less food and water. Who knows? You take a few hundred pounds off that car and it goes a little faster. So many different variables, warmer temperatures, you know, yeah. right. But, but again, does it make sense yeah. to do another Tycon? Who cares? We know it can be done a little bit faster, right? Yeah. I, you know, we all know you can incrementally improve. The next challenge is under mm -hmm. 40 hours is can you break yeah. 40 in a lucid? That'll be a fun car. Beautiful car, by the way. The Lucid, and mm -hmm. then of course, it's gonna the be a nice ride. I think the Plaid Model S might be a contender as well. If there's V3 chargers, again, right. Lucid right. can still charge faster and yeah. should be more efficient. Or we don't know efficiency of Model S yet, but yeah. we know Lucid's gonna be cream of the crop uh, with all the, the on paper specs. But I mean, uh, Lucid beating the S, I think that's pretty clear. But not the plaid. We don't know about that yet. Did that joke just sail over everyone's head? <laughs> lucid. Oh, yeah. Clear. Lucid. Clear. All right. Listen, I'll leave, I'll leave the joke. Uh -huh. that you have to yeah. remember, Eric is the uh, master of puns. Yes. <clears throat> so, yes. He, he spends half of his time thinking about show titles for the show. <laughs> half of my time? I spend no time. You need to shut your mouth right now. <laughs> Triggered. No. Okay, uh, I, 
remember what I wanted to, to, to say. Go ahead. Uh, See, I stalled for time so you could, your brain could reboot. <laughs> yeah, it finally it finally rebooted. So yeah, what impresses me uh, about the Taycan that I don't think a lot of people appreciate it. I mean, everybody was so shaming them about their lousy EPA numbers. But in the real world, the car is really impressive. Like, you know, on paper, us, uh, you know, doing the, the math on, you know, okay, well, it has a higher charge rate, but it only has, you know, 200 and something miles or whatever range. No, 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 no. You're never going to be able to beat a Tesla time across the country. And the thing is, it's so damn efficient, especially with high speed. Like the thing I'm most jealous of in that car is that two speed rear end. Man, does that make a difference when you get into the higher speeds? Like at low speed, I don't think you have any significant efficiency gain over, over a Tesla. But when you get up like past 75 miles an hour, having that other gear boy, Ooh, that's next level. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. The the Taycan EPA range rating is flat out wrong. Uh, yep. Like not even in the same wheelhouse of being correct. Uh, yep. That car, if it was equivalent, you know, it basically goes as far as a model farther than a Model 3 in our 70 mile an hour test than a Model 3 performance. I, yep. I can get uh, just about 300 miles out of that thing cruising at 70. Now, when you run in range mode, which we did most of this drive, it runs front wheel drive and it actually has a clutch that decouples the rear drive unit. So oh, you nice. don't get the benefit of the two gear, but it, it physically stops the rear motor from spinning. When you hit 94 miles an hour, should I be saying this? It <laughs> re-engages the rear drive unit. Uh, uh -huh. So at 94, you can feel it literally spin up the rear motor and then hit the clutch. I mean, it's very smooth, but you can tell stuff's going on. Uh, and then you're running second gear. Where the second gear really helps is at highway speed acceleration. This car pulls, I'm not going to give any numbers away, but to a very high speed, unlike anything else that's electric. Uh, but I think that's the Germans just being German and trying to build an EV for Autobahn stuff. What yeah, they should absolutely. have done yep. was just either ignore the high speed things or ignore the zero to 60 and just make it a single gear. The, the it's too complicated. Is a, no, the Taycan is a proper sports car. The Model S is a sedan, a family sedan that can do sports like car things, but it's not designed as a sports car. And that's the big right. difference. Well, that, that the, the exact point that, um, that uh, Kyle just said is the fact that it was designed primarily for the North American market where, you know, zero to 60 is a huge factor. But once you're past 60, like nobody really cares. But as we all know, the cars basically fall off a cliff after 100 miles an hour because it's pretty much irrelevant in street driving. But on the Autobahn, that's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you got to have a car that can pull from 100 to 150 miles an hour. Otherwise, you're not in the game. So, in order for them to have credibility with the ICE drivers there, they, they had to do it. So, I respect them for taking that route. The Germans don't know any other way. It is, you know, in their heads, it has to be Autobahn capable. Like, they can't yeah. even fathom a car that doesn't go fast. So, uh, but the, the interesting thing that we ran into with the Taycan with this range mode thing was um, the car runs with the suspension all the way down, so you have aero advantage, but then it backs the dampers off all the way to comfort. And that's okay, and we wanted, to, like, that's comfortable to an extent, but when you fully extend the travel of the wheel, then it's really rough over big bumps. So it's smooth, 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 heads in the ceiling. <laughs> uh, and then sometimes when you throw it into corners, especially in the Rockies, uh, the thing's a, a floaty boat, right? It's, we had a, a base one, but with the dampers backed off, you know, it's really a comfort cruiser. So we actually ended up using sport mode for a couple of the technical sections where the car stiffened everything up, really nice and happy to get into the corners. Uh, we also ran with our air pressures very high, of course, just to optimize, uh, just like you guys did. It's the way to do it on cannonballs. And um, so, so we had a lot of factors going on, but I will say those Michelin Pilot Sport 4Ss on that car uh, are not built for cold weather, but they grip like nothing else in cold weather. We were so impressed with the tire performance and lateral grip at five degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, we were clawing onto some corners and it was like, wow, these Michelin builds are an amazing tire. They're, they're great tires. I have a set on mine and they're wonderful. Yes, they are. Yeah, they're legendary for that. They're, they're, it, by no stretch of the imagination should they perform well at that temperature and they really do. It's really quite remarkable. I will say I love the cross climate uh, that I have on my Model 3 now. They're fantastic. <laughs> yeah, those things are legends, man. Everybody loves that tire. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, uh, news came out. Uh, this When this podcast goes to broadcast, when the YouTube video is out, this will, news have already been reported, but uh, Hyundai uh, has now confirmed they are working with Apple on potentially building the Apple car. Really? That yep. doesn't surprise they've now me. There was a rumor before, but now they've confirmed it. So they have gone on the record saying they're working with Apple on that. Uh, it's been a oh. long time since Apple's actually manufactured their own things. I mean, they make a couple of things in Austin, 
uh, but mostly they outsource uh, their manufacturing. So this does I mean, not I mean, surprise I think me it's a good all. selection. I mean, I know that Hyundai and Kia they have done a lot of cars, good things uh, in recent years. I know, you know, early iterations of those companies uh, had their bumps and bruises, but now, I mean, those are really high quality cars now um, that you, you know, if you're looking for an ICE vehicle, that's really among the elite in terms of performance and appearance and aesthetics and did, did uh, I, warranty coverage and yada, yada, yada. Did, did, did I ever you, tell you my mother worked at, at Hyundai Canada when they first came into Canada back in like in the really? early 80s? In the pony oh, days. The quality was amazing back then. Oh, yeah. Really oh, sure great it was. quality. <laughs> thanks, Kyle's being thanks very thanks sarcastic. Mom. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, that's the thing about Hyundai is they, they've had a long storied history of trying to shake the early pony day quality i mean they're a completely different company now they make superb yeah. vehicles but it took them a long time to shake that that bad stigma and th those cars were bad man they were bad yeah anyways i mean they're not amc so they're not they're not well, on that level you know bad. there's been a lot of bad cars out there but uh, anyway oh, sure the, the pony's legendary in terms of when you say bad it's right <laughs> I, up there. I, two years ago i was at the head office in canada and they still had one in the showroom oh really yeah, I got the whole story. On. Well, like my 30, mother works at the plant in Bromont. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I want to say thank you for Kyle for joining us. Uh, you don't have to leave. We're going to get into some questions here. There's only about five or six questions. Maybe we'll just plow through them a little bit and everybody feel free to uh, jump in. I want to say thank you for everybody on uh, on Twitter who submitted their questions. We really appreciate it. We try to help out as best we can. We may not always have the right, correct answers, but we try our best. Anyways, first question comes from Lachlan. He says, do you see an eventual ceiling for Tesla or is the sky's the limit as far as uh, they will spread across all aspects of our daily lives like Apple has Um, I, my hope would be that there would be enough energy solutions installed around the world that would mean that most people's power coming into their home is, would be in due part or somehow connected to the grid by Tesla. Uh, so if that's the way we're doing it, yes. If it's energy solutions, absolutely. If it's vehicle ownership, no. No, there, there's, there's too many kinds of cars and transportation systems to overtake it that much. Um, I mean, almost anybody now can have a, a phone in their hand if they wanted one. Um, but I think energy solution would be the way to go for, for looking at yeah, that. Yeah, I way. think that's a completely unrealized potential for that company right now. Everybody's still focused on the car aspect, but they got this energy thing that's going on. Now, of course, they have to ramp up that side because it's been kind of like the neglected cousin in a lot of ways because Model 3 consumed all of their resources, you know, during 2018 to get that production ramp up um, that a lot of those other products like solar and the stationary storage and power walls and others. I mean, there's people still waiting for power walls for crying out loud. So all that stuff been pushed over to the wayside. So they really need the battery production up so that they can actually fulfill a lot of that mission. It's not like they haven't done some very impressive installations mm -hmm. with, you know, at the utility scale stuff, uh, but they need to do more of that. And the solar, of course, is another factor altogether. We've been hearing horror stories about the, the solar aspect at this point. So anyways, there's lots of potential for them. I think in the car aspect, um, there's still, I mean, there's improvements can be made everywhere, but I don't see any sky's limit as far as cars are concerned because there's, I mean, the demand is still outstripping supply. So, I mean, Norway, there was a story out, uh, I think the last day or so, that Norway could potentially have all new car sales be 100% electric by 2035. Oh, I think um, it'll be but, sooner than that. It may be, sooner. but I know that their goal would be to be able to do that in the next uh, 14, 15 years. So it's, you know, it's, it's good that we've now, we're now at the point where if Tesla is, oh, so close to half a million cars produced last year and sold, um, you know, had there not been a pandemic, you know, you could argue that they could have gotten closer to the 600,000 mark versus 500,000. Um, but it, but it's still impressive all nonetheless when the, the company is not even, you know, is not even 10 years old, ideally. I, I will remind everyone there is one more market segment and it's been kind of floating out there a little bit. Not a lot of people have been paying attention to it, but Elon has certainly alluded to it. That another market that they want to get into, disrupt, if you will, uh, home HVAC systems. There's a lot of potential there. A lot of money to be made because everybody's operating basic, fur you know, furnaces that haven't changed in 50 or 60 years. Heat pumps, man, that's where it's all at. What is Tesla putting in their cars? Heat pumps. So I think that's another market. That I also think at. that down the road, we could argue that RVs could be the next vehicle that they want to disrupt because those suckers are really bad for the environment. 
So Yeah, well, you know, Bev will say lots of things about wanting an electric RV. And I said, well, we're not there yet. I mean, you can buy some European ones, but they're very expensive. RVs are another thing, too. I mean, don't get me going on that, but they, devalu <laughs> they devaluate so quickly. They lose they're so like much boats. value. Yeah, they're, anyways. Yeah, yeah. it's like the best day of owning a, an RV is the day you buy it and then, and then the day you sell it. So, anyways, uh, let's move on here. Next question comes from Chris. It says, why doesn't Tesla install only V3 superchargers from now on? Is it a manufacturing constraint? I should mention that Chris is uh, from Greece. So, I don't know what the situation is in Europe, but I know here in North America, everything going in is V3. 100%. Um, all of the manufacturing of the V3 stalls and stuff is at the gigafactory in buffalo which is you know an hour and 20 minutes here from from where i live uh, i don't know where they were building them before but anyways all that manufacturer has been moved over there so um can't answer that 100 percent, chris but i know over here at least anyways tesla's made it uh, pretty clear that everything's gonna be v3 it, 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 you know i i can't see any reason why they wouldn't do v3 they all but stopped making the um the little urban chargers now you know little black and white ones uh, unless they're, you know, power constrained or whatever the case may be, condos or something like that, that still makes sense, but everything's pretty much V3. All right, moving on. Next question comes from Colin. He says, the current loss, uh, the current cost of upgrading autopilots, $4,000 Canadian. Mm, hold on here. I think he's referring to people who have not bought enhanced autopilot. Oh, right. Real quick, real so, quick, breaking news. Uh, oh, okay. Again, while we're taping, uh, the seven seat Model Y <gasps> standard range is now available. Okay. No All way. Right. I have I have a long standing, and I'm I'm going to check it out. Is it on the website? It is. Uh, they have it at thirty seven. Well, no, no, the no, 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 price. No, no. That's not my question. It's on the site. No, it's the it's know, in the configurator I know, I know, right I know, now. I know, but I have I have a I have a long running bet with Sean Mitchell. Oh, here we go. Here we go. It's all okay, here we go. So pull it up. Who's the winner? Who's the winner in this one? I'm going to be the winner. All right. Five dollars. Okay, so I'm going to go through into seven seat interior. Uh, where are the pictures? Hold on. Sean. <laughs> Sean, bless his heart. Good friend of ours. Believes. We love you, Sean. We love you, Sean. <laughs> that the seats are rear facing. And I've said, no, no way in hell. They're going to be forward facing. I can't so, believe he still believes that. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, I'm looking at Tesla's website right now, and they still so show the rear seats. So model seven seat interior no includes third row seating for two, easy entry into the third row, third row USB-C charging. Why no pictures on the website so we can put this damn thing to bed? The sliding, the sliding second row will have adjustable setbacks. Sliding second row, there it is. Well, there you go. That's there you the go. answer. No there you go. Uh, fold flat second and third rows for maximum cargo storage, and then electronic fold flat releases in the that's trunk. exactly what i've been saying right from the beginning that tesla would implement a sliding second row just like they do on the model x for ingress and egress and this is the problem uh, a lot of people were thinking that it was going to be rear facing because they thought that second row was fixed it would never move wrong 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 i win yeah I the win. uh it's a, <laughs> i don't win anything three, but i win it's a three thousand dollar <laughs> option in yes, the configurator exactly wait right. is it news that the standard range model y has been out uh, no, it's it's uh, still uh, was okay. Or is uh, that brand new? Mm, I don't know. It's a is new. It, it's it, a new standard range RWD. Did yeah, they we have a standard pilot? range. Yeah, it's standard new. range. Yeah, room, the new entry level model range. Y trim is uh, listed at forty one nine ninety. Ah, uh, there it is. Standard any... range finally showed up. This is the one that everybody's been waiting for. They've been yeah. they've, okay. Sorry. Yeah, so much breaking news right now. All right, so <laughs> yes, they finally introduced, uh, just went live on the site. The standard range rear wheel drive Model Y is now available to order. Canadian price is $56,290. In uh, non Kanukistan dollars is $34,190 after, so $40,990, mm -hmm. $490 base price. Pretty decent. Right. Pretty good. Uh, uh, delivery, deliveries in two to five yeah. weeks. Uh, purchase price, estimate payment. I'm looking at uh, standard range, forty four ninety one. Uh, let's see here. I'm on the U.S. site. Yeah. So, oh, I had range? white seats selected. Yes, that'll do it. There you go. But that'll it still it. says forty one nine ninety as the base price. Mm -hmm. There must be some so kind of incentive being applied. US, 56000 Canadian. Uh, prices show include a $1,500 can uh, California clean fuel reward and potential incentives. So i got to customize that and take California off of the list. So if I go to, say, something like Alaska, 
Yeah, forty one nine ninety. Okay, there you go. Got to be careful about those little incentives that, that they do. That. Is what is All right. Hey, that's good range though. Two hundred forty four miles EPA, one thirty five top yeah. speed, and five point three to sixty. These that, are that, all on point numbers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The heat pump does wonders for these cars. Excellent. Three hundred ninety three. 393 kilometers for you Canadians and Europeans listening. Yes, yes. We got In other words, pretty much everybody around the world, Ian. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yay metric. All right, moving along. Um, let's see here. Uh, well, actually, we haven't finished Colin's questions before we get sidetracked. No, um, no, 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 so, no. We've got to get back to so that. So anyways, he was, he was, he's referring to enhanced autopilot. The full autopilot's in excess of 12000 What is it? No, oh, it's $14,000 Canadian. Um, anyways, he says he finds excessive for something now included for free and remains largely unchanged. So obviously he has a prior car because autopilot's now, the basic autopilot and auto steer is now included with a car. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so his basic, yeah, so his basic question is, do you see Tesla reducing this cost anytime soon for the, new, uh, for the few of us early Model 3 adopters um, without basic autopilot? Well, anything can happen, but I don't think so. Tesla's days of... <laughs> Well, you know, end of quarters are always end of quarters, and Tesla's always doing funny never things as never, far man. as you know. So yeah, you know, it's like it's like asking Apple: you're going to start reducing your phones? Like if they're if they're the older ones, sure you can get them for less money, but not, it, like Tesla Tesla needs to start making money, a lot of money. Like they're 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 they don't have a lot of quarters in their history, right? <laughs> where they've made a lot of money. Like they need to continue making money, especially in the environment that we find ourselves in. The stock's not the only thing. I mean, the stock's making people who own the stock money, but Tesla itself isn't making as much money. Um, so it, it's, it's the, I mean, mind you, there's all this FSD money just sitting there. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, they, yeah, so. they haven't realized all of that yet. And, and don't forget, at the last quarter, as an incentive, they gave everybody you know three months worth of FSD, which is you know kind of worthless at this point, as far as I'm concerned. Um, who knows? Ian's absolutely right. Never say never. Who knows? Uh, keep an eye on it. If it's something you want, jump on it. But um, FSD is not getting any cheaper at this point. They're going to keep cranking yeah, up that price until somebody cries, Uncle. All right, moving on here. Next question comes from Sandy, uh, Sam. He says, uh, do you know the reason why they got rid of the silver color in the Model 3? I see it out on the road, and it's a great color. I agree with you. It the is, best. It is a wonderful color. I mean, it's not the prototype beautiful silver that they did. I wish I had it. And a lot of ways, I look at uh, I look at silver Model Threes and goes, oh man, I'd love to have one of those. Put a stealth wrap on it; it'll look really great. Um, I don't know. I th- I think in Tesla's case, it was like maybe it was one of those colors that uh, they didn't get a lot of demand for, so they just kind of unceremoniously <laughs> kind of discontinued it. They did offer it um, a la carte or something like off menu for a oh, while, wow. and then they took it away. So, I, I mean, well, they were pretty clear on that. They really wanted to reduce the complexity uh, and issues that they were having with the paint line. So they they pared it down to the bare m- number of colors. And I think that's now kind of a bit of a problem. Um, you know, I'd like to see them bring back the silver and add a few colors. I know a lot of people would like to see that. You know, they're, they're bragging. I think that the paint line in Germany is going to be capable of doing more. That's a so, different animal altogether. I, I think. Right. L- look, the, the paint facility uh, that they're building in, in Germany... And the one for the Cybertruck in Texas, well, not the Cybertruck itself, but for the Ys that they're going to be building mm-hmm. in Texas, uh, are going to be so much better. I have very high faith that the paint quality will be so much better. California, unfortunately, the Fremont plant, as uh, the paint that Tesla uses is actually very high quality. It's, mm-hmm. it's the California emissions laws that make it so they can't apply it very thick. I mean, we've seen all kinds of cars with, you know, very, I mean, talk to any detailer out there that look at teslas and say the pan is the paint is su- supremely thin on these cars which leads to all kinds of problems so unfortunately uh, you know my opinion is that the cars out of california the, the paint is is very subpar as far as i'm concerned i mean i got very lucky on my car my model x i mean needed a little bit of work on the paint before we had the whole thing done. Um, my model 3 the paint on it was excellent it was it wasn't perfect mind you they never are but um, anyways, I have high hopes that uh, whatever cars they make <laughs> in the other two plants will, will get um, um, the better colors. Um, I mean, we're due for color change. I mean, Elon did say that they're working on a, what do they call it, deep crimson for the Plaid mm-hmm. Model S. We did see a sneak picture of one of those cars. Uh, when and where that will show up, I don't know. I have high fa- I mean, he also said they're going to have a lot of colors for the Roadster as well, more than the five that they have now. 
Uh, for something that's a little more bespoke, yeah, it makes sense that they would do, uh, you know, a few more colors of that. Uh, maybe even hand-painted. Who knows at this point? So, um, yeah, I'm with you. I've always made it um, known that I think that it's time for a change-up in the colors. Uh, bring silver back. I, I mean, I would certainly get a Model 3 in silver. So I agree with you, Sam. It's high time to bring it back. All right, last question of the evening comes from Carlo. Will Tesla ever update the app so we can change charging times remotely? Yeah, that's an awfully... Uh, that's a popular question, I think. Um, the charging times and scheduling and stuff is done in the car right now. Keep in mind, adding it to the phone is probably not enough. They would have to expose the APIs um, at the at the head office level, you know, because everything is through VPN, and then update the app. Um, I mean, Stats app can cancel. There's a scheduler in it, and it can cancel, but you can't schedule anything. So at this point, it's possible. It's just, you know, like, you know, how high on the priority list is it with Tesla to do this? There are times I wish, yeah, it would be really nice to be able to do it on the phone rather go out to the car. I mean, it's cold outside. I don't want to go. Out. <laughs> so um, if it's really important to you, um, let's hop on Twitter and get Elon's attention. And I mean, because that seems to be the only way to get anything done with these guys is try to get Elon's attention on something. So, um, yeah. I love I love how your complaint is it's cold outside. It is cold outside. It's winter. I listen to the whole I, discussion. I know. I mean, I, hold on. Listen, I the just, Floridian. There's, there's, for me, there's nothing dumber than a Canadian saying, hey, it's cold outside. Of course it is. You live in mother effing Canada. <laughs> uh, we have very want, hot summers. Want, listen, I'd love to get the paper, hun. It's cold outside. <laughs> Honey, it's not going to get warm until like April. <laughs> um, May. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, we got global warming. It's been shifting a bit. The oh, polar, don't, polar get us, vortex oh don't get us going on that one. Ian yeah, was washing. Right. Ian, you were washing your car on Christmas, Christmas Day. Day, 13 degrees was, Celsius. That's what 55 yeah. Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's about 50. Uh, 50 yeah, it's 55 degrees right, like, Fahrenheit. Did it, didn't it snow where you live, Trevor? Yes, in we Toronto, had snow, it, and he was out Montreal washing his car. Nice. Five hours away, he's washing his car in the sun. Yeah, that's probably, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's t-shirt weather for us. Can you imagine? <laughs> well, and then last, go ahead. That's it. I was going to say, I just just because it's my favorite climate fact of all time. Last spring, at the end of April, we got snow, and thirty three days later, we set an all time or one degree off an all time temperature record of ninety eight degrees Fahrenheit. Things are so out of whack. Thirty two days. Thirty two days after it snowed. How nuts is that? Crazy. There you go. Ah, uh, well, that brings us to the end of the questions. Uh, so I want to say thank you for everybody submitting and maybe next week or the week after. I think I, we're going to try and do this every two weeks now. There's a little bit too much going on, I think, to try and do this every week. But anyways, thank you for submitting your questions. And I want to say thank you to Kyle for joining us on the show. Always enjoy Kyle's adventures. Uh, make sure you follow him at uh, Out of Spec Motoring. He's got a great website. I'll put a link in the video description. You guys read the article on the drive. And uh, Kyle, make sure you ping me when you release your videos and stuff. I'll make sure I retweet it out so you guys get some activity on that. Cool. So uh, since you're a guest, why don't you go first and let everybody know where they can follow you and have a chat with you if they'd like. Oh, well, uh, chat with me. You're probably going to be talking to Alyssa because she does most of our social ah. media communications. Uh uh, you can just go to our website, outofspecstudios.com. You can see all of our outlets there and uh, choose which one you want to watch. We have electric car stuff, gas car stuff, truck stuff, off-road stuff, you name it. We got it. Uh, but but still heavily focused in battery electric transportation, although I would love to try a hydrogen because I think they're so <laughs> silly. But I want to try it for myself. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you on that one. All right, Ian, how about you? Where can people find you if they want to chat with you? Well, on Twitter, as always, prom, private messages are open, and it's at Ian Pavelko. Uh, at the Tesla Owners Online Forum, you can find me there under the handle Mad Hungarian. Be sure to use the little at Mad Hungarian to make yes. sure that I get, Yeah, you know, if you have a question or something there, you, you have to summon me. And like I like to say, do like Beetlejuice. Do it like three times just to make sure I don't miss it. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm bad about that. I should spend more time on the forum. It's an awesome, awesome forum that Mr. Uh, Pager has put together. Um, and then finally, if you're looking for some Tesla wear, you can go to my Teespring shop, um, go to Teespring, T-E-E-Spring.com and just look up Mad Hungarian Evolve wear and you will find my selection of Tesla shirts there. Excellent. How about you, Eric? Twitter.com forward slash EC fix. Let's go. <laughs> Short and sweet. Just the way we like it. 
All right. Well, I guess that leaves me. You can follow me on Twitter. The handle is Tesla Owners Online. Make sure you visit the forum. It's totally free. Join up. We've got thousands of members on there, teslaownersonline.com. And I want to say thank you to our Patreon supporters, our great sponsors, the guys at uh, EvanX and uh, Fine Lab Ceramic Coatings. i got to remember those guys as well. Uh, thank you for your continued support. And once again, just another reminder, if any business out there would like to uh, sponsor the forum, it gives you a private forum where you can uh, do all kinds of uh, marketing and interacting with customers and stuff, reach out to me. We have two sponsorship slots open for the 2021 season. That's it for us tonight. Thanks, Kyle, for joining us again, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks for watching and listening. See you guys. Bonsoir tout le monde.